dealing as well with World War One. Not yet, but they will. Yeah. They they aren't. Uh, in, well, Europe is, becomes at war, but but uh, the U.S. doesn't join until 1917. <coughs> so that does become an issue. We'll get into this later. Uh, so just a quick recap: the, the legacy suffrage organization is NASA. They're state by state. The upstart suffrage organization is the Congressional Union, uh, which becomes the National Women's Party, and they're just concerned about the federal amendment. So in 1915. Um, they come to Maine looking to establish uh, the main branch of the, of the Congressional Union. And after looking at some possible leaders up in Bangor, they settled on Florence. So that was their first choice, it turns out. But, um, but the, or the organizers all said, oh, for God's sake, don't make the headquarters of Maine in, in Bangor. It takes forever to get there. <laughs> and it was the back of the North Wind. And so they, they were pretty happy with her in the end. Um, so it was, it was caused a problem, and, and the reason why I'm kind of going into this detail around this is that the tension between these two national organizations uh, kind of was, was just completely uh, bookmarked her experience as a suffrage leader in Maine. And it, um, because they, the national groups became increasingly at odds, um, and a lot of sniping in the press and things like that, that, all stuff, uh, that stuff all translated down to the local level as well. And, but Florence kind of kept the peace for a while by saying, look, I'll just work on the federal stuff with the, with the Congressional Union, and when I'm, you know, when I'm working on the main stuff, I'll be working with, with MISA, so it'll be fine, don't worry about it. But it was, it was kind of an issue, and, and things kind of came to a head in 1916, when uh, a couple of things happened. One is that she was chairing the legislative committee for, the, for MISA, and she figured out by the legislators that for the first time ever, Maine had enough votes in the legislature to pass a statewide referendum or to send it to the voters. It had never been able to get that through the legislature before. And um, so she was very excited about it. Maine could be a campaign state, and, and if it won, uh, you know, if it passed it, it would be the first state west of the, um, sorry, east of the Mississippi <coughs> to enfranchise its women, which was a huge prize. And, she, and then every state wanted it, every eastern state wanted that, so it was very exciting. But then Alice Paul hired Florence to go out in, the, in 1916 and campaign in Wyoming against Wilson and the Democrats, because remember, they're holding the pol political party in power responsible. So on the way out, she stops in Chicago, um, and the, the Congressional Union had a, had a um, headquarters there, uh, or a big office there, and uh, Wilson was gonna be in town to deliver a big uh, foreign policy speech. And uh, so she goes out in, uh, this, is, this is like October of 1916, and she joins the procession and they go down, they, they file out from the, the office, the Congressional Union office, and, and walk down to where Wilson's gonna give a speech and Florence and this other woman, um, are, uh, who's the chair of the, the Illinois branch, um, it, lead the procession away, from, and they're, they come down here and they line up, this is actually only half the photo, they're all lined up along the street here. And you can see there's a, there's a mounted policeman there, and uh, in the background you can sort of, you can't really see probably here unless you get up close, but there are all these men um, mm -hmm. back here. And they wait until um, Wilson drives up in his carriage and he gets out and he walks into the building to deliver a speech, and then the mob attacks and uh, just pandemonium breaks loose, and they're grabbing the women's signs and and um, and trying to break them. Um, and and uh, the women, of course, don't want to let go, so they get thrown to the street. And they, you know, somebody, one woman, sprained her wrist, and their clothes get torn. And and these are respectable middle-class women. You, you absolutely do not brawl on the street if you're a woman of, of their uh, social class. And Florence walks over to this mounted policeman and says. You know, he's just sitting there. What, what are you going to do? Are you going to do something? And he said, I have orders not to intervene. And um, so they get chased back to the office and they, they hole up in there and the crowd stands around and heckles them for hours. And this incident <clears throat> made national headlines. And, um, and then she also sent an account of it, uh, a blow by blow description, back to her column in the Lewiston Journal. And, and uh, so all of her. her conservative colleagues back here in Maine can read about it, and they're just like, are you kidding me? We're about to have a statewide campaign, and you're 
you know, brawling in the street out of Chicago. What the heck? And, um, but she goes off to Wyoming, and she's touring around the state, having a great time. She goes to Yellowstone. She gives, like, two or three speeches a day. She's, you know, she's having a lot of back and forth with people about whether or not they should vote for Wilson, because there's a lot of sentiment that Wilson has kept them out of the war so far. I remember, that was his campaign slogan in, in 1916, he kept us out of war. And the suffragists campaigned under the slogan, he kept us out of suffrage because they contended he wasn't using his leadership, his bully pulpit, to, uh, to push suffrage through the, the Congress. So in the end, of course, Wilson gets reelected, and she comes back to Maine, but she's just fired up. She's convinced that, that this kind of activism is exactly what suffrage needs in the US. She gets back to Maine, and her, you know, her colleagues are like, well, you're, you're done here. You know, if you could, we'll let you lick stamps, but you absolutely cannot have a public face on this upcoming referendum campaign. So she's sitting home alone one night and trying to figure out what she could do because she can't work for the statewide campaign under the Congressional Union because they only do the federal amendment. And her former colleagues have kicked her out. So you know, then she hears a knock at the door and this, she opens it and a group of her friends are standing there and they said, well, we just formed a new suffrage organization to work on this referendum campaign and we elected you president. <laughs> and, um, so will you accept? And she said, gladly. So she was really excited. And that poem that I recited at the beginning was the poem that she recited to the legislature in early 1917 when they went up to, to formally ask for that um, statewide referendum, which they approved. So suddenly made the campaign state, this is like the end of February, and they set the, the um, vote uh, for September 10th. So they think they have a lot of time, but what happens in April, uh, the U.S. enters World War I, and all of a sudden, just overnight, all these women who had promised they would work full-time for suffrage and they would raise all this money and they would do all this work, uh, just get vaporized. All their money goes to the Red Cross and war bonds, and they're all, you know, doing all kinds of, like, knitting and things like that, and, and including Florence, it turns out, <laughs> Uh, because she had two sons who went off to uh, to fight in the war, and both of them were in the, the very infant uh, uh, Air, Air Force. One flew, he was in the first group that get, got trained out in Ohio to, to fly the blimp, the dirigible, and the other one flew, uh, he was a bomber pilot. So I think, and, and she could see what a crisis this was for her community, that their, the sons and the brothers and the fathers are all going off to war, and I, I think she just couldn't not be part of it, you know. She, so she volunteered for the Red Cross. She started out um, running their publicity bureau, so she had to you know, get things into the newspapers about, um, you know, various fundraising drives and things. But later on, uh, she um, chaired the committee that kind of interfaced between the families and the, and the uh, the military, because of course there was no VA in those days. So if your loved one went missing or something, what happened to his paycheck? Nobody knows. I mean, there was no, there was nobody who could go ask about it. So she, that was the job that she took on in her committee. So things were pretty busy there for a while, and it wasn't until like June or so that she could really get rolling on suffrage organizing, and, and, the, and Misa was active in it too. But. Um, and, and so I was, I was saying earlier before everybody got here, but she had this friend who was um, uh, an amateur cartoonist, um, and his name was Frederick Freeman, but he, he did his cartoons under Will Arcady. And this is one of his cartoons. He did probably 15 or so of these. And they published them in the newspapers and then post them in their office of the, uh, it was the Equal Suffrage Referendum League of Maine that um, her friends formed and, and voted her to be president of. And they had a, um, an office at 652 Congress Street, and it had these big bay windows, and so they, they post these posters in them. And um, so, you know, from June, July, August, she got really busy on suffrage stuff, and she was just cranking. I mean, she was inviting speakers and, and uh, holding, you know, different events. And uh, in, in June, she actually took over the, an issue of, of uh, the Daily Easter Argus, and, and there had this deal where if you uh, did all of the, got in all the advertising and, and did all of the editorial work, you could use the paper to publish all kinds of suffrage material and sell it and, and, uh, and keep, you know, keep the profits. And um, so she did that successfully in June, and you know, she was really doing a lot of work. And, um, but Maine was a pretty stuffy state, 
and um, and and she had.